Okay, the bars are epoxied in. Six bars going down many inches. Plus four wedge anchors, giving you plenty of support. And a 16 inch sauna tube is going to encase the whole thing. I'm going to put on the lateral cross ties after this sets. The anchoring cement is extremely strong. Um, since it's going to be cemented under a concrete base, it's not going to get too wet. Um, it sets up in 15 minutes. In one hour, it's stronger than concrete. So, this should be good. Now, I'm going to show you how to bend rebar. I want to make some hoops. So, this is a two foot piece of rebar. This is a conduit bender. down a little bit down a little more side now. This side wants to go in. Not sure. Pretty good. This side does not have to. Bend this end in a little bit. perfect half circle. Now, in a usual construction, if you don't have the I-beam, if you're just making a concrete pillar, you'll need a lot of ties. And that's basically to support the axial pressure coming down. In this case, we have an I-beam. And the chances of this thing coming down and buckling out are nil, especially with the weight we're dealing with. Because all of our force is lateral. So, these are more important than the cross ties in our construction. But we still want a couple pairs to give it a little re uh, reinforcement. 
and to hold the rebar in place so when the tube goes on, everything lines up right. Right, the sauna tube is in place and braced. You want to get it all up in one shot if it's in different pieces and go all the way to the top and pour it because taking time to align them while you're pouring is going to be no good. So we're ready to pour. All right, the solar tracker array is complete. All the main things are done. We got all 20 panels on there balanced correctly. And as you see in the front, there's a small panel on the bottom of the mast. So let's go up and take a look. Today I saw up to 2100 watts coming out of it. Pardon me while I climb this icy hill. It's freezing out. Okay, so we have the small panel going to a battery which is mounted right behind it on some angle iron. I made a little uh, battery holder mount. So it has a protective cover, and in here we have just a marine battery, a small one, which holds a charge controller, just a cheap charge controller. Right now it's getting enough sun, so this battery is all topped off. So this battery stays nice and charged from a 60 watt solar panel. Off of this battery, yeah, off of this battery, connects into our electrical box. All the panels connect into the solar tracker box which allows you to auto adjust. It's weatherproof so that could be outside. All the wires come down and into the main junction box that's frozen. And here we have nothing else than a terminal block with fuses. So we have 20 panels in a 24 volt configuration so two panels together is a series and two of those series connect into a parallel and come down into one wire so there's five wires for 20 panels um, you want to put a fuse in between the parallels so if there's a short on one of the panels it doesn't back feed through a wire and fry a wire and cause a fire so the uh, the wires are about 10 gauge, so they could handle roughly 20 amps, 20 or 30, 30 amps. Um, so you want to fuse them before 30 amps. Now each short circuit current is like seven and a half, uh, under eight amps. So if one of them short circuits, it's going to be eight amps. So if there's two of them in a row, that'll be 16 amps going through the wire. So you want to make sure you fuse that wire with 20 amp breakers so in case there's a short it's not going to fry the wires the wires could hold 20 amps or the wires could hold 30 so if you use them at 20 or 30 so in here this terminal block is like 10 bucks at the auto parts store it's great um, pretty much you put your wires going in and I use car fuses which are rated up to like 37 volts or whatever but it holds the voltage of the array pretty good and the out is rated up to 95 amps so at most I'm gonna pull up to 80, 81. So this thing for 10 bucks, you save a lot of money and you could just put car fuses right in it. So all solar panel uh, parallel leads go into the fuses, then come out, combine into one main four out wire, which goes underground into the house, into the charge controller, into a breaker, then into the charge controller. And all the negatives just tie together right onto the wire with a clamp. This video is about the charge controller and the uh, power production on the solar system. Now this here is a program that monitors um, the solar system, the Outback equipment, via a Python script on the server. Now as you can see I have everything set up where currently the charge current coming in from the solar panel is 60.5 watt uh, amps. So say it's about 60 amps. Currently I'm in inverter mode and I'm pulling out 59.6 amps of so 60 amps. Uh, 1500 watts, 1400. So right now the inverter load 55.7 and 
the charge controller at 60. I'm powering everything on the load with the solar. Plus, I'm putting a little bit back into the system at the same time. Now, if you look at this, this is an MPPT charge controller. It's uh, an Outback FlexMax 80. Um, so, what this does is, is, is it's, it's a smart controller, per se. So, I actually have 46 amps coming in from the solar panel at 34 volts. But the controller changes it to 60 amps because the lower the volts, the higher the amps. Um, you know, Ohm's law. So it adjusts the, the, the voltage of the solar panel array so we could get maximum amperage out and charge your batteries at a good rate. Now, this number here, the solar, this is coming from a shunt that measures it on the input of the solar. It's saying I have 1219 watts, but this number isn't necessarily correct. The number you want to be watching is off the charge current, which is 61.8 amps. Now, let's go to the other screen. This is from the inverter itself. So the PV output, which is the solar array, is producing 1600 watts currently. Whereas on this monitor, it's saying it's producing 1285. But the more consistent number is on the inverter itself. Now, the inverter output, we're pulling 1.1 kilowatt, which is about 1,100 watts. So we have 500 watts extra power that's currently charging the battery bank. Having your settings optimized is a little bit of a task, because how this charge controller works is it's only going to pull the wattage that you need to power your load and keep the batteries at a good state of charge. As you see now, my batteries are at 87% charged. Now, there's no way to really verify this unless you have a proper hydrometer, which you can check the battery acid to make sure it's charged properly. But um, I'll get into that maybe in another video, maybe not. But um, we're just going to have to accept my numbers for now. Now, this is a solar uh, graphing logging application that you know keeps your logs in a MySQL database. It's freeware. Now there are other software that you could use to set everything up or not. Now let me go into some more complicated stuff. Currently the charge mode on a charge controller is in bulk. After bulk it's going to go to absorb. Now you need to set your absorb voltage based on your battery conditions. So you have to look on your battery manufacturers to see what they recommend for absorb voltage. Now, I use wet cell battery bank because they're proven, uh, uh, you know, they're time tested and they work well. So, my absorb is at 29.2 volts. So, in a little while, this charge mode is going to go to absorb and it's going to let this, uh, let in as much voltage to bring this battery voltage up to 29 volts and it's going to keep it there for however long I say. Since I have 675 amp hour battery bank, I'm going to keep it there for about three and a half hours so it can really suck up some charge. Now, you have to make sure your load, which you're pulling off your inverter, right now I'm pulling 2400 watts. So 100 amps going out, 66 coming in. So I'm pulling roughly 37 amps off the battery right now. So right now I'm in a black, or I'm in a red, sorry. Um, so it's a balancing act to set your absorb time and your voltages so that you're not wasting too much power because every time your batteries are really charged up and the voltage is real high, right now, you know, they're kind of low, 24.4, because I'm pulling 2400 watts out of it at the same time. As soon as this load stops, this voltage is going to shoot back up to 26, 27 volts. Um, you know, it's a temporary draw, but it's, you know, there's a lot of power in the batteries. It'll, you know, it'll be able to sustain this for a while. Um, so right now we've got 70 amps coming in, 102 out. So um, the MPP charge controller tries to optimize everything and adjust it. But you want to make sure 
you're pretty much always pulling a good load on it. Not this high, because I'm over maximizing it, but you want to make sure you're using it because if you're only pulling, say, 500 watts in a day, and your panel's producing 800, I mean, 1800 watts, um, it might charge like two to 300 watts. It might use charging the battery, and then it'll charge the load. So you'll be pulling maybe like one kilowatt, and you'll be wasting eight or 900 watts going nowhere, just be throttled down. So you don't want that to happen too much. So what you want to do is while the sun is out and bright, while you have great charge amps coming in, up to 70 amps right now, while your amps are rolling in, you want to get your housework done. You want to get your vacuuming done. You want to get your clothes washed. You want to get your dishes done. You want to use your pressure cooker to cook your uh, your beans and rice. You want to do everything that's going to draw a lot of electricity in your day while the sun is out beating hard. So that way... All your house chores are done. You use all the electric that you're making, pretty much. And afterwards, you have enough power to charge your battery bank enough in case you're off-grid to make it through the night to handle your furnace or whatever else you need to run at night. So it's a balancing act to keep your battery state of charge optimized. Um, you know, they recommend going down to 50% and then back up to 50% and every now and then topping it off at 100 and then the average days, you know, you want to lose about 25-30%. So it should go down to uh, 70 or 75% each day and then go back up to the 90s and then back down to 70-75, back up to the 90s. Every now and then you want it to go down to 50 or so because they're, um, the batteries are designed to go that low and it helps them stay fresh. And every couple months, maybe every four, five, six months, you want to run an equalization on your batteries, which means you... Uh, uh, use the settings with your battery manufacturer and you run the batteries hot so it uh, uh, takes off all the sulfate that are on the battery plates and it cleans the internal internals of the battery. Now one other thing you want to be careful of is your uh, <clears throat> this gets even more confusing but there's a function on an inverter called HBX which is high battery transfer on the inverter which means when the grid reaches a certain voltage, say 27 volts, it will drop the grid and start using inverter. And it will use that inverter for so long until the voltage reaches your low point, which is like 24, 23 volts. At that time, when the battery is getting low at 23 volts, it goes back onto grid and lets your batteries charge back up and put it back up to 27. Then it drops grid again and goes back to 24. So it keeps the inverter system running. Now, there's a little... uh. There's a lot involved in that with delay times and whatnot to make sure your battery stays, um, you know, up to charge because you don't want to lose too much, as I was saying. <clears throat> so, say this goes up to 27 volts. Say I'm off grid, my state of charge is low. I mean, I'm on grid, the state of charge is low on a battery, and it reaches 27 volts, but it hasn't had enough time to suck up the voltage yet to bring the state of charge up. So you set a delay on the HBX mode that says when it reaches 27 volts, it delays one hour, two hours, half hour, however long you need. So the state of charge could absorb some of that energy before it drops grid. And then the last thing is, after this stage of bulk, it's going to go into absorb for three hours, which I have mine set to. And after absorb, it's going to go into float which means the battery is at the end of the day and it's going to uh, you know, try to top it off. You have to set a float setting. Now you look on your battery battery manufacturer and they recommend about 26.2 for my batteries. So mine's set for 26.2 to float. But the issue is if HBX is set to drop the grid at 27, after it goes to float, it will never drop the grid again. Because it keeps the voltage at 26 and wastes all your watts. So it's a balancing act to make sure that your state of charge stays correct and that um, all your delay settings absorb, uh, time delays and whatnot are all set correct, and float settings are all set correctly too. Now, there is an advanced software out there that lets you set specific commands, which I'm thinking about purchasing if. If I can't keep this balanced with the default settings, the advanced options let you specify 
all circumstances to change all the values on the fly. So, you know, if if the battery state is 25 volts or under for three hours, do this and then do this. Or if, and, and you know, based on current conditions, if the incoming charge amperage is under this, do this. And you could uh, use those commands to get your inverter to do exactly what you want. Now, I'm not sure if I'm going to go that route yet or not. I have to give it a little more time to see the uh, the battery state of charge. I got to get my hydrometer readings to make sure my state of charge is correct. I got to see what this array could really do. As you see now, it's this says 1594, but if we go back to this array, it's saying I'm doing 1930 watts. Now that's just about peak. I have uh, a 2400 watt array. But you could expect about 77 to 80 percent of that, you know, at a really good time, which is about, you know, 18, 1900. So this is about as high as my array could put out. But this alone is plenty enough to do all your housework and power your house. I'm not saying you could run central air conditioners and 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 you know a well system pulling your your uh, your, your water into a pool and whatnot, you know, but it's enough to handle all your chores in a day, pump enough water to last throughout your day, power your furnace at night, uh, you know, as long as you're not using electric heat, um, you know, and handle your basic needs, have lighting, wash your clothes, wash your dishes, cook your meals. Of course, electric stove, you know, you're not going to use, you're going to have to figure out something else with that, but 2400 watt panel array should be enough to handle you know, the average necessities of, of most houses. So I know this isn't a complete video and a lot of it's going to be uh, more confusing than it is informational, but if anyone needs to review it or go over some fine details of it, I have some, uh, some information here to go through. So this is the system currently working.